For American children today, one of the greatest health risks they face is from a startling source. Some of the very foods they eat. Open this candy. Unhealthy foods candy. are literally making our children sick. These foods are aggressively marketed to young children. Kids as young as two can identify their favorite cartoon characters, like Dora the Explorer, on packaging. Hey, buddy. Marketing campaigns are in the billions. Cocoa Krispy cereal, a part of this nutritious breakfast, unlock the magic. But grassroots groups can bring real change locally to their own neighborhoods and communities. The time is now. In a few moments, we'll show you what some people are accomplishing locally today. Since 1980, the likelihood that a child is overweight has doubled and for teens, it has tripled. People of color are at greater risk than their white peers. They're more likely to be overweight and suffer from heart disease and diabetes. Word on the street is huge and hella good. Food and beverage companies often specifically target people of color with aggressive marketing. We're overrepresented and overmarketed too for just about everything unhealthy. Makani Temba Nixon is executive director of the Praxis Project and has a long history of achieving real change in the marketing and sale of tobacco and alcohol. She sees parallels with junk food. Right now, our society is dealing with the effects of poor eating habits. We all share those costs in, in heart disease, in cancer, in all of these forms of morbidity and mortality. And how do we then fix it? How do we then address it? If we don't address it with kids, where else are we going to address it? There are multiple reasons why people eat too much junk food. But one major cause is not only the explosion of unhealthy foods available to children, it's also food companies' marketing of products like candy, sugary cereals, snack foods, and fast foods directly to children. These two-year-olds are having a great time. But they don't know this game is advertising. Kids can't tell the difference between sales pitches and real content. Marion Nessel is professor of nutrition, food studies, and public health at New York University, as well as the author of Food Politics. They have to be 8 or 10 or 12 before they can begin to distinguish between something that's done just to sell them something and something that's there because it's real information. And so these are impressionable young minds. This kind of marketing works. A major Institute of Medicine report recently found that food and beverage marketing to kids under age 12 leads them to request and consume high-calorie, low-nutrient products. Even the industry's own Children's Advertising Review Unit found that the mere appearance of a character with a product can significantly alter a child's perception of the product. It's what the marketing to kids' business calls the pester factory. No candy. The object of the game is to get kids to ask their parents to buy the product. You get a kid hooked on Coca-Cola at a very young age, that child will prefer Coke over Pepsi for the rest of his or her life. That's the hope. Many companies try to deflect these criticisms by pointing to their corporate community service efforts or the healthy food choices they offer. A McDonald's executive was recently quoted as saying its salads and other healthier foods cast a favorable glow over their brand. In order to understand what you can do to counter the favorable glow of junk food advertising, let's first have a crash course in the basics of marketing. The food and beverage industry spends over $10 billion a year just to reach children and teens. That's a million dollars every hour, every day, targeting our kids. That money breaks out like this. Just a fraction of the total is TV ads, about one billion. 4.5 billion is spent on youth targeted promotions like coupons, contests, and events like this hip hop concert. Two billion goes to youth PR, like programs encouraging food sales to raise money for schools. And $3 billion is spent on packaging designed for children. Remember the Dora snack pack? Or how about SpongeBob SquarePants? And that's just the traditional marketing methods. In recent years, companies have also moved aggressively into internet marketing. They build websites chock full of fun games and other interactive activities for kids. And it's all advertising. Of course, the kids may not know that. 
Here's a disclaimer that's so small it's easy to miss. And then there's another recent tactic, ads delivered directly to kids' cell phones. This is startling to many parents who often get cell phones for their teens so they can be in touch with their kids. I didn't really intend for that to be a vehicle for corporations to advertise to my son. You're not having dinner with us, right? It's sneaky and kind of underhanded when corporations send ads to kids knowing that the kids are going to see them and the parents aren't. Whether using traditional marketing or these new media approaches, companies reach children through the classic four P's of marketing, product, place, promotion, and price. Product includes products designed just for kids, with packaging like Dora or SpongeBob. Children pester mom or dad to buy the product when they see the character. Place is both where and how the product is distributed and sold. For example, candy is at children's eye level in grocery store checkout aisles, and fast food is sold on many school campuses. Promotion refers to the ads, point of sale displays, and websites that make the product seem fun and enticing. Logos and ads reach children directly when posted in schools or delivered right to a child's cell phone or email. Finally, price. Volume discounts like supersizing can encourage people to eat more than they would have otherwise. Value menus are designed to bring in customers looking for a bargain. Although advertising itself is produced, distributed, and regulated at the federal level, there's still a lot that local communities can do to protect their children from this kind of marketing. We can look at those four Ps and as local organizers, look at how to, how to address access in each of those areas. So thinking about those four Ps is also a helpful way to think about local organizing. Gwendolyn Smith is one such local organizer. She heads up the Good Neighbor Program. Smith works with local merchants in the primarily African-American neighborhood of Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco. The Good Neighbors program uh, was developed because it is extremely needed here in this community. Um, we suffer from um, a higher rate of uh, diabetes, um, malnutrition, um, and obesity. And plus, there's um, a lack of accessibility to the grocery stores. For this neighborhood of 31,000 people, there is just one large supermarket. If you live at the other end of Bayview, it could take you an hour to get there by bus. Most people buy their food at a corner store, but choices are poor. Often the only produce you might see is a picture on a bottle of alcohol. So the Good Neighbor program works with corner store owners to encourage them to carry more fresh produce. Before Good Neighbor, this market carried only a few items in its produce section. It was a very small quantity of produce. The basic items in the store, which is potatoes, uh, I mean, a couple head of lettuce and a couple head of cabbage. Today, Sam Alaudi's store stocks a wide variety of quality produce. Good Neighbor helped get this store to this point. Among other things they help with is advertising. Well, I mean, I didn't spend any money to advertise. I mean, the Good Neighbor program is advertised for me. And they were talking to people until they understand there is a produce and the produce is good and good pricing. The change is a win-win. Store profits are up and residents have access to healthy, affordable food. The reason why I do shop here is because the produce has improved. Um, I am now a diabetic, have been for the last three years. Um, they encourage me to eat better. I enjoy the greens, the celery, you know, all the produce that's here. And since I've been eating it, it has made me feel better. Good Neighbor achieves its success by intervening with all of the marketing peas. Product, a wide range of fresher produce is now for sale. Place. Fresh food is now more widely available in an underserved neighborhood. Promotion. Ads and flyers increase awareness of where this produce can be found. Price. Good Neighbor works with store owners to connect them to distributors of produce with lower prices. Owners pass savings along to customers. Good Neighbor's strategy is well designed and well funded, but you can start anywhere with smaller but still measurable steps. There are a multitude of approaches community groups can take along the lines of the four Ps. One is working with school boards to change food that is available in schools. The state of California recently banned soda sales in schools, but unhealthy food logos and advertising still pervade school campuses. Some communities are now succeeding at banning all marketing of unhealthy foods on campus. 
This policy is passed by local school boards, one board at a time. This is a P for place strategy. The other tool that is, I think is very underutilized at the local level is land use and planning. That um, every neighborhood should have a grocery store with real food. If you get a license to have a grocery store in any community, they should at least make 50% of their money from actual food. If they're making 75% of their money from alcohol, tobacco, and junk food, that's really not a market. Other place strategies include working toward a moratorium on new fast food outlets or identifying vacant lots that could be transformed into community gardens. Even getting local supermarkets to create candy-free checkout lines can make a difference. In the product category, local groups could work to pass an ordinance requiring all chain restaurants to display nutritional information on their menus. This sample menu shows calorie content alongside the price of each item. Promotion strategies include banning toy giveaways with less nutritious food. Another idea? Asking grocery stores to refuse to display promotions that use cartoon characters to promote unhealthy food. And there's always the price strategy, trying to pass taxes on specific types of junk food. The money generated could be spent to create health promotion campaigns, as has been done with tobacco. So where do we go from here? We are truly at the beginning of a movement around healthier environments and availability of healthier foods. 25 years ago, anti-tobacco activists were just beginning to dream of a time when smoking would be banned in public places. But that's exactly what we have today. It's a direct parallel to junk food. I think that we're, um, we're getting the fire going. I like to see when we walk down the street on Third Street in Baby Hunters Point that um, fruits and vegetables just pop around at you. You can see them a block away. You know, it's advertisement there from nutrition and not, and not billboards with liquor signs or um, tobacco signs. I think more people are going to embrace and understand why we as a community have to stand up and really regulate and limit access and limit the promotion and look at this very differently. Um, it's not harmless. And I think more and more people realize that. Once you see the evidence laid out that way and see the extraordinary amount of money that marketers put into marketing foods directly to kids, uh, you begin to think, well, this business as usual can't continue. This has to stop.